Greetings class. Today we will be exploring John Wesley's The Means of Grace, inspired from Malachi chapter 3 verse 7 which reads, Ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. The sermon was written in a time in which one could say believers in the Church of England had a false sense of salvific security. In other words, those who professed to be believers had become lazy agents for works of piety and or works of mercy. They believed that the grace experienced in and salvation working through baptism made them exempt to the inner spiritual work and outer acts. According to our Maddox reading on page 218, the majority of Wesley's hearers in England considered themselves to be Christians by virtue of infant baptism. Yet, few of them showed evidence of personally appropriating the renunciation of sin and newness of life that was expressed in baptism. In a sense, they believed the baptism cleansed them, them of their sins, but they had yet to realize that the renunciation of sin was something that they would have to uphold in their daily actions and in the depths of their hearts. They believed the baptism was a symbolic and spiritual denotation of new life, but the evidence of new life was lacking in the way they treated others and many cases uh, create and in many cases created division in the church. Some believers in England boasted in their works of mercy while yielding no signs of inner change. Others focused on piety while failing to make themselves agents in communal love and social justice. These were troubling times for Wesley. So what does he do? He picks up his quill pen and writes The Means of Grace, a theologically rich sermon filled with rhetoric around the means of inner work and outer work by which we come to know and experience agape love as an ultimate end. In the remaining time that we have, let's explore the five sections of this sermon together. In section one of the means of grace, John Wesley sheds light on the spiritual and religious complacency of the Church of England in the 18th century. Further, he uses the apostolic church as the quintessential model for Christians living by God's ordinances or divine decrees. He opens the sermon with a rhetorical question. Are there any ordinances now? Since life and immortality were brought to light by the gospel, clearly there were still ordinances that the church was taught to live by, but they had come too comfortable with spiritual stagnation, meaningless outward acts of service, and a lack of inward spiritual development. Wesley said the apostolic church's constant practices of these ordinances is beyond dispute. And quoting Acts 2, uh, he says, For so long as all that believed were together and had all things in common, they continued steadfastly in the teaching of the apostles and in the breaking of the bread and in prayers. Wesley's reflections and choice of scripture hints at authentic community. Outward expressions of love and genuine inward reflection as primary ordinances of God and ordinances that the apostolic church was intentional about practicing in daily life. Wesley believed his listeners were not only complacent, but confused, disoriented, if you will. Some saw outward works of mercy as the end result of being a devout Christian. However, Wesley presents ordinances, the works and commitments of the apostolic church as the mere means to an end. In his sermon, he describes the believers of his time saying, some began to mistake the means for the end and to place religion rather than in doing those outward works than, it, than in a heart renewed after the image of God. 
they forgot that the end of every commandment is love out of a pure heart with faith unfeigned. In other words, and to put things in today's context, as the United Methodist Church and as the Universal Catholic Church, we spend a lot of time doing works. But how many of these works, actions, and events truly renew our hearts and spirits? How much of your worship and ritual do you think is drawing self and others to God's agape love? Wesley said, external worship is lost labor without a heart devoted to God. This means that without God's grace actively working and growing within you all, within you, all of your works of mercy and even the outward expression of baptism is in vain. On page 218 of our Maddox reading, it says, the crucial question was not whether one had been baptized, but whether one was continuing to participate responsibly in the transformation of life that the grace signified in baptism empowers. Not everyone who is baptized and publicly participates in the work of the church is indeed working towards the end of all means, which is God's love. There are examples throughout history or the more on the more extreme side of history, we see figures like Hitler. Hitler was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. Throughout recent centuries, people have terrorized, colonized and enslaved others all in the name of God and with the proclamation that they are using the means that were given to them. Wesley saw the dangers of separating works of piety from works of mercy. In modern day terms, soul justice and social justice go hand in hand. They are the means of grace that bring us to God's overwhelming love. Section two of Wesley's sermon addresses the many means of grace, or as he puts it, the many signs, words, and actions that are ordained by God. The primary means discussed are prayer, reading, scripture, and Holy Communion. For Wesley, both private and congregational prayer are essential. Concerning private prayer on page 214 of our reading, Wesley saw private prayer as the grand means of drawing near to God. It was also a means of shaping Christian character. It's no wonder that prayer would be a primary means. Wesley considered it the main way of connecting and commuting, communicating with God. What better way to draw closer to God and to position oneself for gifts and grace than through prayer? After prayer, Wesley touches on the reading, hearing, and meditation of scripture. According to the Maddox reading, Wesley encouraged his people to read a portion of both the Old and New Testaments each morning and each evening and to meditate on them. Wesley recommended these methods, not for the believers to display expressions of piety, but for the believers to continuously engage in scripture reading so that the text would be ingested within the mind, body, and soul. Any, in many ways, to constantly be opening oneself to the scripture was the same as continuously opening oneself up to receive God's grace and the move of God's spirit. Though Wesley saw the various means of grace as important in, in ultimately drawing the community of believers to agape love, he emphasized that they were not saved by their works of piety or works of mercy. Wesley said, not for any works, merits, or deservings of you, but by the free grace, the mere mercy of God, through the merits of God's well-beloved Son. You, ye are thus saved, not by any power, wisdom, or strength, which is in you or in any other creature, but merely through the grace of power or power of the Holy Ghost, which worketh in all in all. Wesley takes the religious notions of the day and turns them on their heads. 
declaring the salvation that is given through grace as something that is completely separated from one's own works and merits. This is not to say that works and merits are not important expressions of Christian faith and growth. This is simply to say, or it simply means that God's grace and salvific power of Christ cannot be attained through the power and will of men or women, but through the power and grace of God. Now that we know where Wesley stands on saving grace and the different means of grace, where do you stand? Moving on to section three, John Wesley tells his listeners that those who find themselves in a liminal space between pre prevenient and justifying grace are to wait for it in the means which hath ordained. In using, not in, lay, in using, not in laying the means of grace aside and to continue asking and seeking for the hopes of entering into God's kingdom. In other words, the experience of justifying grace is something that is arrived at after putting in the work of actively seeking God's presence in our lives through the means gives through the means given to us. Those who seek justification are not to wait passively, but to be actively engaged in all of the spiritual practices and means of grace that guide us to justifying grace and sanctifying grace. Wesley believed that when one was diligent in seeking God and asked to receive the Holy Spirit, that in due time and God's grace, they would receive the Holy Spirit. Ask and ye shall receive. Wesley saw it as being just that simple. In his sermon, Wesley parallels the power of asking to receive the Holy Spirit with the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18, verses 1 through 5. It is through this parallel that Wesley raises the importance of persistence and ceaseless prayer in the life of anyone seeking to draw closer to God. Wesley further drives the point home by raising scripture like James chapter 1, verse 6, which says, Let him or her ask in faith, nothing wavering. To put things another way, Wesley hints at the courage and boldness that is required to reach justification and audacious commitment in the midst of waiting. The means of grace is necessary for those who desire to have a conversion experience. On page 220 of our reading this week, we see the Lord's Supper as a means of conversion. Wesley noticed that those who did not have the assurance of faith received it through the communion service. He concluded that God offered in the Lord's Supper converting grace as well as confirming grace. For participants, who were yet to be converted, um, the Lord's Supper was a space of inward reflection and a call to focus on Christological assertions made through the act of taking the bread and the cup. Christological assertions made through, it was Christological assertions made through the act of taking the bread and cup. It represented Christ's death, sacrifice, and Christ's transcendental presence and grace that is available to all people on all levels of their spiritual journey. When it comes to means of grace as a tool of conversion, Wesley teaches us that one can and should be practicing works of piety and works of mercy in the meantime, in the waiting room of justification. Wesley would have encouraged those in spiritual liminal spaces to pray, to hear, see, and read the scriptures, to participate in the Lord's Supper, to prepare oneself for the grace-filled revelations of God. In section four of the means of grace, John Wesley addresses the six objections towards the means. He had a lot of naysayers, a lot of enemies, a lot of objectors. So here we'll be addressing the six objections towards the means. Primarily, those who object 
are saying you cannot use these memes, as you call them, without trusting in them. Wesley's response is, where is it written in scripture that one cannot use means of grace without trusting in them? In this debate, Wesley holds scripture as the rule for measuring and testing the objections given. He further asserts that if Christ did not warn them against the temptation to trust in trust in means rather than God, that people were making false claims and false assumptions. Where other people in the church believed there was danger in trusting in the means of grace, Wesley openly trusted in the means of grace, not for salvation, but so that the me these means could guide him to the God of salvation. He says, by the grace of God, I will thus trust in them till the day of my death. That is, I will believe that whatever God hath promised, she is faithful also to perform. And seeing he hath promised to bless me in this way, I trust it shall be according to God's word. Secondly, people objected to Wesley's idea of the means of grace because they thought it was seeking salvation by works. Seeking salvation by works. Wesley replies that his views on the means of grace as works to be done um, in the midst of waiting for God, not the works that bring salvation. He, re he reiterates that it's not his works, but the merits, the sufferings, and the love of Christ that brings anyone to salvation. In a third objection, some in the church were saying that Christ is the only means of grace. And Wesley was saying that this was a simple play on words. As you can tell, Wesley was constantly defending his ideas around the means of grace, and he received a lot of resistance to these ideas. In a fourth objection and in a battle of interpretation, some were saying, but, does, but not, does not the scripture direct us to wait for salvation? Wesley retorted with scripture saying, for the whole sentence runs thus, in the way of thy judgments or ordinances, O Lord, have we waited for thee? Isaiah 26 verse eight. He was hinting at an act of waiting that was done in the midst of justification and sanctification. For Wesley, act of waiting was far from sitting in a chair somewhere and waiting for tongues of fire to fall down. Act of waiting included prayer, reading of the scriptures, the Lord's Supper, among other means of grace. And throughout the section, Wesley addresses two more objections. The objection that says we should stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and the objection that if we be dead with Christ, why are ye subject to ordinances? According to Colossians chapter two, verse 20. And to all of this, Wesley says, all who desire the grace of God are to wait for it in the means which God hath ordained. In Wesley's perspective, Though works of piety and works of mercy were not the way one received salvation, they were essential components in the act of waiting to receive salvation through the grace of God. On which side of these debates do you stand? What are your objections to Wesley's means of grace? What would it look like to wait for salvation without works or means? There are many critical questions to ponder. I hope you develop some yourself. Lastly, section five of Wesley's The Means of Grace talks about the order and manner of means. Wesley talks about the order of means that lead up to conversion. He gives the example of a man who goes to worship service out of curiosity with no intentions of truly encountering God. However, there is something that is said that catches his attention and gets him interested in reading and sitting with the scriptures. Later, he reads the scriptures and becomes further intrigued. Wesley puts it this way, and by all these means, the arrows of conviction sink deeper into his soul.
He eventually moves from reading scripture to prayer and other means of grace until he finally experienced the justifying grace of God. Further, Wesley sees this as the order that believers should present the means of grace to those who may have an inkling of curiosity about the divine grace that is available to all. For those who have yet to receive the justifying grace of God, Wesley encourages them to read the scriptures. And if they are going through tough times to communicate with God through fervent prayer, the gradual use of means of grace from Wesley's point of view inevitably draws one to experiencing the grace of God. In the sermon, he says, and thus may we lead him or her step by step through all the means which God has ordained, not according to our own will, but just as the providence and the spirit of God go before and open the way. To put things differently, we as believers may plant and water the seeds that that is offering people the means of grace by which they open themselves in faith. But it is God who gives the increase, the increase in faith, divine wisdom, the increase in spiritual growth and the increase and the gift of salvation. On another note, the means of grace, according to Wesley, are what people or, or are what lead people to find the blessing of God. They are varied, transposed, and combined together a thousand different ways. In other words, everyone's spiritual journey and experience towards salvation is uniquely designed for that person. There are various means of grace and various ways of journeying, journeying towards justification and sanctification. Perhaps God made it this way because all of the beauty diversity, all of the beautiful diversity that is humanity. Also, Wesley reminds the listener of some important tips as often as they are using means of grace. He tells the listener to keep a watchful eye out for the move and the revelation of God. Further, he reminds the audience that apart from God and the grace of God, the means are meaningless. God's mercy and grace are the only way to receive salvation. He goes on to say the mere work done profit of nothing that there is no power to save, but in the spirit of God, no merit, but in the blood of Christ, that consequently, even what God ordains conveys no grace to the soul if you trust not in him alone. On a final note, Wesley stresses the importance of our use and understanding of the means of grace. He wanted to, the listeners to know that it was important to remember that God is above all means. He wanted them to know that there was no power in the means but in God. That in the midst of using all the means to seek God alone and to be careful not to boast in self, but only in God. May God's love be the end for all of your means of grace and works on earth. Stay health healthy and stay happy. Have a great week.